You can do it. You can do it. 11 amps. Oh, oh there's the black smoke. The purpose of this series is to highlight all the weak points of the ubiquitous RAM 3D printer controller shield and then discuss how we can desuckify them a little bit. We're going to cover all the problem areas like MOSFETs, connectors, polyfuses, common user errors, all that stuff. But first, I'm going to be comparing and contrasting six boards that I got randomly from various sources on the internet, and then I'm going to tear them apart. Why? Because I love you. Actually, I have to destroy them to test the components a little bit, but uh, it's all for the best. And by starting with a comparison of random boards, I can show you practically why some people have great RAM experiences and other people end up in a hellscape of blue smoke and melted connectors. It'll also give a good launch pad to segue into more detailed videos covering each of the danger zones. But for now, let's go ahead and look at our rogues gallery. Here is a lovely panning shot of our six boards in their natural habitat. Note the variation in coloration and plumage between the various models. We have specimens from all over the globe, representing the standard Ultimachine Ramps 1.4 PCB pattern to the Asian Ramps 1.4 variant, and even a Ramps 1.5 with surface melt MOSFETs. Aren't they lovely? I can hardly wait to start tearing them to pieces. But wait, dinner before dessert. Why are we even talking about this? I'm not going to give you a complete history of the ramps board. You can go to the RepRap wiki and look that up by somebody who can tell it much more eloquently than I can. They're readily available. Everything's open source. You can make your own, have them made, or buy them from somebody who's made them. The, the standards have uh, been set, and as long as you adhere to those somewhat, it'll work somewhat. And that somewhat is what seems to be the problem. Now, with any DIY endeavor, there's going to be user error, that contributes to a lot of these problems, or um, just a lack of going back in RTFM, you know, reading the reading the manual. If you don't know what the board was specced for, you don't know what you can plug into it. Fortunately, a lot of people will just go on forums and see what people recommend and say, oh, this bed heats up really fast, I'm tired of my slow bed, I'm gonna plug this into it, with complete disregard for what the MOSFETs and the connectors can actually do, those types of problems. Even if these manufacturers stick uh, somewhat to the original specifications, uh, there's a chance of bomb components, counterfeit components, fabrication errors, things like that. So it's good to go and break down each of those individual parts, especially the important ones, i.e. the ones that can go up in smoke, and see what we should look for in a quality board and how we can fix that on our own or customize the board so that we can use it for whatever we want it for. It's perfectly viable to plug a 300 watt PD bed into your board as long as you have the supporting circuitry and connections to do that. I've seen some horrific advice, a lot of it being anecdotal with no actual scientific data or testing. So I felt that was one of the holes in knowledge that I like to fill. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. This will all become more clear as I go through this review of these six boards, compare them, contrast them, show you some of my notes in the spreadsheets. That I First board we're gonna look at is a Ramps 1.5 board from Big Tree Tesh slash BQ, Big Qua, by, by Qua, whatever. Um, the big difference in this board is that it uses surface mounted MOSFETs, which are nice because it can use the entire PC board as heat sinking. They haven't released, as far as I can tell, the schematics and design files for these. So a lot of this is a mystery. When I pulled one of the MOSFETs off and tossed it in a test jig, it actually tested out better than the datasheet specs. Uh, they're using the uh, official MOSFETs, albeit the SMD version. I think it's the uh, D2 or the D squared pack, whatever. It has the larger surface area, so it dissipates heat a little bit better. And uh, it came out at uh, 15 milliohms, which is actually lower than the specified RDS on. So the good news is that it'll perform better than the stock specified MOSFETs for the ramps board. The bad news is it's still not great performance. But with the additional heat sinking of the PCB, you should be okay within a reasonable range.
Next up is what was called a Ramps 1.4A from Robotal, but it was an Italian company, so maybe it's Robotale. I, I have no idea. The 1.4A seems to designate that it used a different etch pattern. So the good news and the bad news about it is the good news seemed like they thickened up a couple of the traces. Uh, the bad news is they accidentally bridged all the jumpers, so they don't actually do anything. They're all permanently on, which is fine if you're running at max all three jumpers in micro-stepping, but if you want to change things, you're screwed. Other things I liked about the board were it used an upgraded 3205 MOSFET, which has a lower RDS on. It also used poly fuses that were rated for 30 volts, so you wouldn't have to change anything if you were to convert to 24. All the surface mount components are 24 volt compatible, so you don't have to worry about that. And the MOSFET's RDS on was under eight, which puts the dissipation under one watt for the package, so you don't need a heat sink and it'll be fine in ambient cooling. This board actually had the highest amperage rated output connector at 16 amps and it had a 15 amp input connector, which are still both surprisingly under spec, but they're more than enough for what the board can handle. Next board is the Key Studio Ramps 1.4A, which, as you may have expected, uses the same etch pattern as a Robotel, Robotale, whatever. I had high hopes for this board because it just looks so good. It was black, it had the yellow connectors, I really wanted to use it, but unfortunately the micro step settings aren't gonna work, so. I'm not gonna say too much more about this board because it's virtually identical to the Robotel board, except even though it used the same IRF3205 MOSFET as the Robotale board, I pulled it off and I tested it and it's nowhere near as good as the MOSFET on the other board, which is neither here nor there because a lot of these devices, they fall within a range, but I also tested the gate capacitance, which fell way below spec. So it seems like this is a fake. Now, that's not too bad. There's good fakes and there's bad fakes and this fake is a fake of an upgraded MOSFET not the original MOSFET so it's still halfway decent. Next up is a Ziltec or ZYL tick. I'm not sure which it is, Ramps 1.4 standard board. This is a Texas company and it uses pretty decent parts, but it has one big problem. These MOSFETs are just junk. It's not the board seller's fault. Sometimes you get these bad batches. Uh, if you've ever built, bought electronic components on eBay, you know what I'm talking about. Don't do that, by the way. But when I pulled the MOSFET out and I tested it in a jig at five volts on the gate and 12 volts on the drain, it was 40 milliohms, which is twice the specified resistance. So that means you're gonna be burning off almost five watts. That's, that's a no-go. If you try that without massive heat sinking and cooling, you're never gonna get that up to 11 amps without the MOSFET melting down to slag, which is all unfortunate because the rest of the board was pretty good. Since the MOSFET measures 40 milliohms, that means the bed has to be kept under five amps not gonna happen. That means 40 watts, which is about what a hot end heater cartridge pulls. So you should be okay with the other MOSFETs, but it is going to be all three of the MOSFETs the same. So I think that's a no-go, unfortunately. This is the first of the boards that I had to put into the danger, danger, stay away Will Robinson category.
These last two boards we're going to lump together because they're both generic unbranded boards. They're very similar. They use similar connectors, which are both underrated. The etch pattern, uh, the traces are pretty thin in some parts. The holes through the board are not plated, so that's crap. And although they both use the standard specified MOSFETs, they're still on the high end of the spec and they're not going to meet our 11 amps current, so you may be able to get away with a lower current bed. They both tested out roughly the same in RDS on, somewhere between 25 and 30 mil ohms. The main difference is being on the US generic board that cost me all of three whopping dollars. The solder joints were real sloppy but still usable, whereas on the Chinese board, the headers were soldered in completely crooked and you would have to take them off and at the entire thing, which I wouldn't want to do without plated through holes because you're probably going to tear the traces off anyway and might as well just toss it out and get a new. The blue output connector on a Chinese board was also not labeled. The danger in that is that those particular connectors range anywhere from 5 amps output to 25 amps output. So the un unlabeled ones are likely on the low end. So I'd probably say probably not over 10, maybe eight if I were feeling brave. I didn't pull the connectors off and run current through them until they caught fire. I didn't think that would be a good idea. But the power input connector is definitely only rated at 10 amps. So this board's just a complete no-go. Part of the reason for those reviews and compare contrast was to give you some information on these particular boards in case you wanted to buy them. But it's also about showing you the issues that are involved so that you could be a more aware consumer and a more aware DIY builder. Now to put a button on this episode, it's unreasonable to expect everyone to pull off their MOSFETs and test the RDS on and run current through the board until you melt it down to find uh, what your current limits are. Well, here's some practical advice that you can follow. Don't use boards with unmarked connectors. That's just not good. If you want to live on the edge, they, they probably used 8 to 10 amp connectors for those cheapies, but I wouldn't bank on it. Also, look out for fake electronic components. Now, a lot of time it's hard to see on the boards, but if they give you a couple close-ups and you can see that it's, for example, a, a ST Microelectronics MOSFET, but it's in the wrong packaging, that's a pretty dead giveaway that it's fake. Now, just because it's fake doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad, but it could mean that it's bad. I'll be covering more of that in the MOSFETs video, how to read the part numbers, how to recognize fakes, that type of thing. I'm gonna break a couple apart and show you what the insides look like. And if you wanna be on a safe side, go with a board that has upgraded parts. Uh, a couple of the pieces I got, one of the boards that had upgraded MOSFETs, they were definitely fake. They didn't meet specs for that MOSFET, but since they were upgraded, they were still better than even if they had real deal original MOSFETs on it that were uh, originally specified. The thing that's most likely to melt down your board is either using the input connector wrong, hooking your wires up wrong, which I will cover in the connector video. But the second most common problem is using a bed that has too low an electrical resistance, therefore it sucks too much current, puts out too much wattage, and it melts your connectors. So always make sure before you buy a bed, there's a resistance rating on it. At the end of each of these board reviews, you'll notice that I put a minimum resistance on there and a maximum wattage, just in case they give you one of the other numbers. So follow those. I'll show you the math on how to figure that out. And secondly, always check your board's resistance when it comes. So if you order something and it says it's, you know, 1.5 ohms, don't assume that. Just put a meter on it. And granted, um, it's a thermal element and the resistance is going to change, so don't get really bent out of shape if it says 1.3 and it's actually 1.2. Just make sure that it's in the ballpark and it's something that your MOSFETs can handle. Uh, if you don't have an ohm meter, 
and a voltage meter, you should definitely get one if you're going to be putting these kind of kits. It could literally save your life or save your house from burning down. And the last few points have to do with modifying the boards. If you have soldering skills, go ahead and just replace the bed MOSFETs. Uh, in the MOSFETs video, sorry to keep referring to that, but there's a lot of information I have to pack into that, so I had to split this up into a, a multi-segment series. Uh, I'm gonna give a couple of recommendations. I also have a five minute data dump video that's gonna show you how to go on to reputable parts distributors parts and search parametrically for parts that'll work for you. If you don't have those kind of soldering skills or equipment, or you're just afraid to mess up your board, be safe and just get a, a small heat sink and put it on the bed MOSFET. That'll buy you a margin of error of a watt or two, and that could be all the difference in the world. I found heat sinks for 24 cents a piece that would work and fit on the ramps board that I use. And finally, if you have the space, this might be just me being paranoid, but it's a, put a small fan across it. You're never gonna hurt anything with some air cooling. It's also gonna help your stepper drivers. It'll help a little bit with false triggering on your poly fuses, so that's a good idea as well. So that's it for this video. Make sure you check out the other videos in the series. It could be the difference between getting a successful printer or burning your house down. Also check out the links below. Check out my Patreon if you want to support this page, subscribe, all that stuff is down there. You know the drill, just check it out. So thanks for tuning in, happy building.